At one point in time, The Ultimate Fighter was the perfect slice of entertainment. It was meant to encourage new fans into the sport of MMA and show that fighters aren't barbarians, but people who, yeah, have motivations and families and things they are fighting for. But also, yes, will get very drunk and make good reality TV. I like it. It was also the only platform of its kind for new fighters to get into the UFC. And especially because the regional scenes at the time weren't exactly streaming their fights on YouTube or UFC Fight Pass, getting into the Ultimate Fighter guaranteed you, at the very least, some exposure to the fans. And of course, the two coaches would go head to head on tough and then head to head in the cage, as it was all kind of meant to promote and help build anticipation for a actual UFC fight. But somewhere along the way, the whole meaning behind the show kind of just got lost. And perhaps now more than ever, the show is just kind of pointless. I'm Balian from MMA On Point. Shout out to you legends, the MMA OP Hall of Famers. Thanks for supporting the channel. You guys are the best. And these are the 10 most pointless seasons of The Ultimate Fighter. What's up, fight fans? UFC 306 is finally upon us, and that means Sean O'Malley's coming back. He's defended his bantamweight title against Marab Davalashvili. It's going to be a great fight. Of course, being partnered with DraftKings, we know everything you need to know, and we've got you covered. All new customers who bet just $5, right, you get $250 in bonus bets instantly. Make sure you download the DraftKings app and sign up using our code MMA on point. And you could stay in on the action, use the $250 in bonus bets for some same game parlays for an even bigger payout. I love a good parlay. You can combine multiple bets together for the same fight, including the number of rounds or the method of victory. And the more bets that you combine, the more you win. If you do want to get involved and sports betting is not yet available in your state, don't worry. With DraftKings Daily Fantasy, you can still get in on the action, make your picks and still be in with a chance to win some cash prizes. All you got to do is download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. And if you're a new customer, use the promo code on point. You just put $5 in and you get $250 in bonus bets instantly. So don't forget it's promo code on point only at DraftKings Sportsbook. DraftKings, the crown is yours. Number 10, Tough the Smashes. Okay, unless you're actually even from Australia or the UK, you probably won't have any idea what the fuck Tough the Smashes is supposed to mean. Well, I can tell you that The Ashes is a cricket competition that takes place every two years between England and Australia, and they play to retain the trophy, which is the ashes of some old cricket bale. In 2012, though, someone thought, yeah, that was enough of a reason to base an entire season of The Ultimate Fighter on. Sure. Now, I'm not trying to shit on anyone here, but the coaches for this random season weren't exactly the top guys in their divisions. Ross Pearson and George Soteropoulos. Ross had won the ultimate fighter, but he was actually coming off a loss and was just two and three in his last UFC fights. And George had had a great win streak in the UFC, but the time of filming, he was already on a two fight losing streak. It just meant that the coaches fight between these two guys didn't have any stakes or anything on the line. And so it kind of felt like, well, why are these guys coaching? It's not exactly Rashad Evans versus Rampage Jackson, is it? On the UK side of things, the winner, Norman Park, seemed like a top prospect, but he didn't end up faring that well in the UFC and has made more a name for himself outside of it even. A very young Brendan Lockname was also on that season, but he got eliminated and then lost his only UFC fight. And 12 years later, he's still not back in. The only redeeming factor of this season was that it gave us Robert Whittaker. When you're wearing the green and gold, that's... That's when it starts getting real. Now, obviously, a tough season producing a future champion counts for something. But apart from that, I think most people forget this season ever even happened. Number nine, Tough 25 Redemption. It's not that hard to work out what season 25 was trying to achieve. It's in the name, right? Redemption. It was an entire season dedicated to guys who had been on tough and would get a second chance to try and win the show. I mean, you did get a lot of recognizable faces, which is cool. But at the same time, by the end of the show, you know, the quote unquote ultimate fighter is really about 35. This guy's the ultimate fighter. Now watch him retire next year. OK, I'm kidding, because on one hand, tough 25 had a great coaches matchup with Cody Garbrandt and TJ Dillashaw, and we really got to watch their rivalry get intense. <laughs> Team Alpha Male was also involved and they did the fight for a title. It was great. Okay, you couldn't ask for better than that. But you know, on the other hand, the entire concept of the tournament turned out to be super pointless. Again, this was for guys who didn't win the tough show, but then also had a pretty terrible time in the UFC afterwards. But I guess they were short one guy or something because James Krause, who had already been in the UFC for three years, threw his name out there and got given a place on the show. Like, what the fuck, dude? I, I know he tried and didn't get into the house in season 15, and even then he was way more experienced than everybody else. And to be fair, you know, he got an ankle injury in that one. But James was on a two-fight UFC win streak in 2017, and he was going into a tournament with a bunch of non-UFC caliber guys. 
seemed like a bad idea. And it looked like at first he was going to smash everyone, but then he ran into Jesse Taylor, who managed to submit him in the third round. Hey, where to go, Jesse? That's the guy who got to the finale in season seven, but got kicked off the show for acting like a prat. This is nine years after that, and Jesse actually wins the show. But as most of you probably know, it was pointless. Despite the name of the season, there was zero redemption to be found because he immediately tested positive for steroids. Jim Carrey said in Dumb and Dumber, you know, I, I totally redeemed myself. Thank God for TJ and Cody, or this season would have been a total fucking write-off. Number eight, Tough Nations, Canada versus Australia. Again, to me, it seems a bit random to do an entire season of The Ultimate Fighter based on two countries' rivalries. And to be honest, I've done some research. I don't think there is a rivalry here. This whole season was just random as hell. This is the first time I've seen snow. It's so soft and... But then it can be hard as well. But again, if you want to talk about a season supposed to hype up a fight between two coaches, well, this again wasn't really it. I mean, Team Canada had Patrick Cote and Team Australia had Kyle Noak. Their fight wasn't for a number one contender or anything like that. And it was right at the end of both guys' careers. So, I mean, they brought great coaching to the table. It's just like no one was particularly excited to see them fight. There are at least three Canadians who you might recognize now, even if you look back at the season, though. Olivier Aubin Mercier ended up winning for the welterweights. Elias Theodoro won the middleweight bracket. And Cajun Johnson was also on the show. But all three of those guys would become famous for things other than being successful in the UFC, which is kind of the point. Orban Mercier won $2 million in the PFL. Cajun Johnson helped lead Project Spearhead for the fighters' rights. We're going to enlist the National Labor Relations Board to see whether or not we are employees or independent contractors. And Elias contributed to the sport with his writing and advocating for marijuana exemptions. All great guys, but absolutely nothing to do with the tough season, okay, which kind of just ended. Kyle and Pat had a good scrap, and that was about it. The UFC just rolled on as normal. Number seven, Tough Brazil won. Okay, long ago, the first time the UFC went to Brazil, in 1998, there were two young Brazilian sluggers going head-to-head, -head, a 21-year-old Vitor Belfort and a 22-year-old Vandalay Silva. Vitor Belfort is the winner! 44 seconds! Belfort then won the UFC heavyweight title, in a weird way, admittedly, while Vandalay became a dominant champ in pride. Flash forward to 2012, 14 years later, and both fighters are once again in the UFC. Belfort had just picked up a big win over Rumble Johnson. Vandalay had bounced back with a finish of Kung Lee. For the first time in years, a rematch legitimately seemed on the table. The UFC saw an opportunity and quite sensibly decided to do the first ever Ultimate Fighter Brazil with the two legends, Belfort and Silva, as coaches. Fucking great idea, and surely a great fight as well. But of course, it never happened. The season was okay, again, but didn't really do what it was supposed to do, produce a serious new Brazilian UFC talent. The winners, Honey Jason and Cesar Ferreira, had fairly long but very hit-and-miss UFC careers. The whole season was built on the rivalry and the 14-year rematch, and of course, the fight was cancelled just one month out. Vitor picked up a hand injury, Rich Franklin stepped in to fight Vandy, and he beat him. Imagine the disappointment, folks, okay? Belfort actually ended up getting a title shot out of this whole scenario against John Jones, but that was mainly Dan Henderson's fault for pulling out of UFC 151. Since then, Vandalay has called out Vitor for a bare knuckle fight in 2019, for a boxing match in 2021. We are like 30 years removed from the first fight at this point, and we have still never had a rematch. Tough Brazil, you, you let me down, man. Number six, Tough 22, US versus Europe. The build-up to the fight with Conor McGregor and Jose Aldo will go down as one of the most marketed and hyped of all time. You cannot argue with that. But it quickly had the brake slammed on it when Aldo pulled out and Chad Mendes stepped in. Now, Conor still won and held up a title, but it was an interim one. And instead of the Aldo fight being immediately rebooked, we suddenly got a random-ass season of The Ultimate Fighter. Now, in hindsight, if the other coach had been Jose Aldo, well, shit, that might have been amazing. Maybe the best season ever. But instead, it was Uriah Faber, a bantamweight with pretty much zero chance of the two of them ever fighting. I asked for this fight in I Dublin. Asked for the fight. I asked for the fight in Dublin as he a warm-up to the Aldo fight. So, again, it doesn't really make a compelling start to the season. And for Connor, everything must have felt a bit pointless when it was clear he was pretty much only there to support his teammate Artem Lobov, and then the guy lost in the preliminary fight to get into the show. I mean, Mac could have just walked off the set right then and there, wouldn't he? 
Artem actually got wild carded back in and made it all the way to the finale, but we didn't even get a proper one of those with this season. Saul Rogers was supposed to be in the finale, but get this, he was banned from the UFC because apparently he lied on his visa. And now has problems getting into the country and cannot fight in the finale for the ultimate fighter. So Ryan Hall got boosted to the final. And of course that guy had already been eliminated from the competition. So what we kind of got was a fake finale between him and the guy who got eliminated before the show even started. Granted, it did feel a bit less pointless after Ryan won because he seems like the most promising prospect out of everybody. But in the last nine years, he's only had five UFC fights. And is he coming back? Who knows? Long and short of it, it's been uh, 16 surgeries since. Number five, Tough 26, a new world champion. So the first time the UFC did a whole season of The Ultimate Fighter to crown a new champion of a new division, it was actually pretty successful. The champion Anthony Pettis coached against Gilbert Melendez, and from that season, we got Rose Namajunas, Angela Hill, Joanne Calderwood, Tisha Torres, and of course, a new champion, Carla Esparza. Now granted, she didn't last long, and Pettis versus Melendez held up the division for like a year, but I'd say still a pretty successful season. But some sequels should never be made, okay? Sorry, Starship Troopers 2. And Top 26, a new world champion, should have gone straight to VHS. They put 16 flyweight women into the tough house to fight it out, and there didn't seem to be any problems. But there was one major issue by the end. The best girls in the house couldn't even make the weight class. The finale was supposed to be Sajari Eubanks versus Nico Montagnu, but on the day of the weigh-ins, Eubanks fell ill, and so a runner-up got her spot. And no, it wasn't a young, new prospect. It was the oldest veteran on the show, Roxanne Modafferi, and she nearly won. Nico Montagnu got the victory, and she was crowned the new flyweight champion. But here's the thing, guys. Apparently, she wasn't even a flyweight. She'd only ever won two fights in the weight class, and as soon as she was given the belt, she was never able to defend it because she couldn't make weight. Okay, so what happened in the end? The UFC booked Valentina Shevchenko versus Joanna Janjacek for the vacant title, which it fucking feels like they could have done in the first place. But oh well, it's fine. I guess they wanted fighters in the weight class and filling up the division, and maybe Val just wasn't ready. Either way, tough 26. Let's just move on. Number four, tough 11. One of the most anticipated matchups in the early days of the UFC was the bad blood fight between Tito Ortiz and Chuck Liddell. Now, the fans had waited years, but when it finally happened, it delivered, okay? They had a rematch a few years later, and this time, with a title on the line, Chuck knocked out Tito again. But the rivalry was far from settled, and as both guys started to lose to the other top contenders in the division, it kind of made sense for both of them to just run it back. It was the most interesting fight for both guys. So why not throw them both in a season of The Ultimate Fighter? It makes perfect sense. We get to watch them coach against each other, watch the rivalry build and get us hyped for the trilogy fight. But the whole idea was completely pointless. Why? Because Tito Ortiz was so injured going into the show, there was no way he was ever going to be able to fight Chuck Liddell. Uh, I told you he was going to do this bull****. I told, I told him day one. I, I said, that's why I didn't want to do this with him. I don't like the guy and I didn't want to do the show with him. The only reward of the show was getting to punch him in the head afterwards. So yeah, for Chuck, the whole tough process was immediately pointless. We are going to leave tomorrow. Tomorrow's your last day. Dana was so pissed and decided that if Tito needed surgery, then he was going to kick him off the show and send him to a doctor the very next day. The Huntington Beach bad boy had to fight back the tears. He still had one guy left on the show, but Dana was sending him home, which meant, yeah, the entire 10 episodes of the season up until that point were pointless. Ultimately, season 11 did give us some staples like Brad Tavares, Court McGee, but Chuck ended up fighting Rich Franklin, who again stepped up to save the day and knocked Chuck out. He's down! And maybe another Chuck Liddell knockout could have been avoided if this season played out how it should. Shit, maybe we wouldn't have got that terrible trilogy fight in 2018. Number three, Tough 31. All right, so don't get me wrong. Was I excited when I heard Conor McGregor was coming back? Yes. Was I excited when I found out he'd be doing a season of The Ultimate Fighter? Okay, yeah, uh, pretty much. But against Michael Chandler, what a fun fight. I'm sure the competitive rivalry on the show was only going to hype us up, but the whole season just kind of fell flat. Don't get me wrong, it was great to see Connor back and getting involved in coaching, but also knowing that he demanded his teammates get into the show before agreeing to do it was a bit uncool, I guess. And all I felt like I ended up doing was just questioning a lot of the strange tactics and coaching he was doing. I mean, I don't know what I'm talking about, but... Just feel where the pain is. Put your hand right on the pain. It's no longer here now. You can actually feel the pain here and really, really, really feel it. And then just get 
Really? The whole concept of the season was let's bring in old veterans and newcomers and mix them together, get different looks amongst the teams, let the coaches pick. But that became pointless when Connor decided, oh, I'm just going to pick all the new guys and give Chandler the vets, which led to a massacre of a season with only one prospect winning a fight. Which meant ultimately at the end of the season, we got zero new UFC talents, just two veterans who already, I mean, I don't want to be rude, but kind of failed in the UFC. Second chances and all that, okay. But both guys have just kind of done okay. I mean, they both won and lost so far. And maybe the most pointless thing about this season, when the fuck is this fight happening? We found out about it in February 2023, waited all year, but it was never booked. Then in 2024, it wasn't booked until six months into the year, and then it got cancelled, and Dana has said, not this year. He won't fight this year. So it's probably going to be two years without this fight going down. If it happens, makes the whole show seem pretty pointless, right? Number two, Tough 16. Right from the beginning of this season, it felt like one of the coaches, Roy Nelson, already thought this whole process was pointless. It seemed like it was basically a waste of his time and probably ours, and it immediately also seemed like Dana regretted his decision to hire him as a coach. He likes uh, good fights. First, you got to get in the house. That's the first goal. Roy then carried that half-assed attitude to the coaching throughout the show, and in hindsight, I mean, why the fuck did we even ask this guy to coach? This season is... Uh interesting he was going up against shane carwin who just fought and lost to brock lesnar for the title so initially there is some intrigue in the matchup it wasn't champions going head to head but either guy could position themselves in line for a belt with a win but once again these coaches never fought each other just one month before the season finale shane picked up a knee injury he was replaced by matt mitrione who'd been on season 10 with roy back in the day and it took just three minutes for big country to knock him out the fight with shane was never rescheduled and it immediately felt like what did we just watch 12 weeks of television for? Season 16 might have had some redeeming qualities if any of the guys who got to the finale were actually able to do something in the UFC. At first, it seemed like Mike Ricci, the Canadian, was going to win the whole show, like another Rory McDonald coming through, even if he was a bit of a dick. The type of conversations I have, I can have with, with these people, you know, they're just not at the same level mentally. But he was beaten by a pure wrestler in the finale, Colton Smith, who went on to lose three straight in the UFC and never came back. Ricci also didn't do so great, so he didn't even get any good fighters out of the season either. Although that's not true. Neil Magny was on Tough 16, and he's still knocking about, so there's that, I suppose. And number one, Tough Latin America 2. Fair play to the UFC for branching out and building up MMA in other countries. I know that the UFC gyms in PI and China, it didn't seem like a big deal, but look at the talent we're getting out of there right now. The first time the Ultimate Fighter did a Latin America version, we got Yaya Rodriguez, Marlon Chito Vera, some fan favorites, okay, and the two coaches that season, freaking Fabricio Verdum, Cain Velasquez, all right? The heavyweight title was on the line. Thousands of MMA fans watched an entire season with subtitles just because it was for the heavyweight title. But season two, guys, season two just, I mean, it might as well basically not have existed. Right, so first of all, the two coaches, Kelvin Gastelum and Efrain Escudero. So you got a middleweight and a lightweight. Not going to be fighting those two, are they? And I mean, there's just no rivalry there whatsoever. Yo y Calvin Gaslam, somos amigos desde la prepa. Somos uh, gran amigos. And unfortunately, the show didn't produce any UFC talent at all. I mean, you can have a look at the names of everyone who was on that show. Shit. Have a look at who won. You've probably never heard of them. And what a shame, really, because the first season was so great. But Latin America 2, yep, genuinely, guys, probably just a waste of everybody's time. Oh, I love a good Ultimate Fighter video, me. Any excuse to do an Ultimate Fighter Top 10, I'm doing it, okay? Big shout out to Max Randall. Thank you, Max, for editing this one. Show him some love on the social medias or his new YouTube channel, The Combat Arcade. Shout out to all of you Hall of Famers out there. Thanks, guys. We appreciate extra support you give us on the channel. If you want to join them, guys, there are some cool benefits. Click the button down below, find out more. If you enjoyed the video today, go ahead, give us a thumbs up or a like. We appreciate that, guys. If you want to see more from us as well, you can always click subscribe. You'll get notifications and you'll never miss a video and we make a lot of them. I'll see you in the next one anyway. Bye.